As part of the UNEP Plus Science Series, we reviewed five European Research Council laureates at TEDx Brussels. Each laureate was funded by the European Research Council. The ERC is the first European funding organization for excellent frontier research. Every year, it selects and funds the best creative researchers to run five-year projects based in Europe. It also attracts top researchers from across the world. We spoke with Jonathan Coleman, a physicist specializing in graphene and two-dimensional nanostructures. He showed the TEDx audience how graphene can be made in a kitchen blender. I work on making nanomaterials, and in particular making two-dimensional nanomaterials. So probably the most well-known of those materials is graphene. So graphene is, is the building block of graphite. Graphite is just a stack of, of graphene sheets. They're one atom thick sheets. And stacked together like a deck of cards, you have, you have graphite. But people discovered about 10 years ago that if you separated graphite into its individual sheets, that those sheets, they're called graphene, have these wonderful properties and they're unlike any material. So what we do is we make this graphene in large quantities. And the idea is to make good quality graphene in very, very large quantities and ultimately in industrial quantities so that this is a material that will be able to be sold and hence enable further industrial applications. Okay, what are the, the properties of graphene that we can't find anywhere else? Well, for example, it's got a lot of, of really cool properties. It's the strongest material known to man, it's the most conductive material known to man, it's the, mo the best conductor of heat, it doesn't let anything pass through it, it's the most impermeable material known to man. So what's really interesting though is it's got all of these superlatives in one material. So people sort of have got very, very excited by this and think, you know, well, it can do anything. So graphene is really this wonder material. But the question that we have to answer is, okay, it can do all of these things potentially, but what can it do in practice? And that's what we're really the research is going towards at this moment. And what do we understand that it will be able to do in practice? Well, I mean, for example, you could imagine graphene as the electrode in the front of a, of a TV or a computer screen that lets the electricity in and lets the light out. So there are very, very few electrical conductors that are transparent to light. If you look at a metal, it's shiny. It's usually, you know, you can't see through it. So graphene has this unusual property. So we would imagine that there's, there's a good chance that we will see graphene in displays. Now, one of the problems is, and this is a, a general thing, that you have to be able to make uh, these products at the right price. So there's always an economic question and, and, and a costing issue. And what we don't know yet for a lot of potential graphene applications is will the price be right? How does research work uh, in a uh, university environment today? Well, I've got a re I'm, I'm a professor. I have a research group of about 20 people. So there are maybe eight or ten people that have PhDs, so that are a bit more experienced, and maybe ten or, or twelve people that are working towards their PhDs. And these guys are funded by a mixture of the European Research Council funding, which have funded a lot of my work, Irish government funding, and industry funding. So it's a sort of a mixture. And so we have the, this team that are working on dis different aspects. Some people are making graphene, some people are making other two-dimensional materials, some people are looking for applications of those materials. So these are all important sort of parts of the work and really it's when you bring these parts of Jigsaw together to create a bigger picture that that's when you get the breakthroughs. Okay, what's the next stage for you? Well, for me, I mean, we, we are trying to, to follow up on our, our ERC-funded work by making new two-dimensional nanomaterials that people have never made before. And then the idea is that some of these materials will have properties that we haven't seen before and will allow you to make things that just were impossible before. And ultimately, we would like to commercialize these things. But this is really the excitement of, of nano. New nanomaterials will have different properties enabling applications that we can't even conceive of now. So in five, ten years, you can imagine you know, technologies that we've no idea now, and they will be ubiquitous, and they will drive social revolutions similar to the revolutions that we saw when you know, smartphones came in. And I think this is very, very exciting because we don't know where this is going. So you're so, working blind. That's what, one of the nice things about, about research. You never know what's around the corner. And you have, in some ways, a chance to shape the future, and that's a very exciting thing. Okay, our economic recovery in some part will be determined by our capacity to innovate. Is Europe good at innovation? I, I think so. I think we've, we've, we've a lot to learn. So in my own research center, we're a little bit different from most. We've got an industry-facing research center where we have to do our own research and then we have to work with companies to try and solve their problems and in some cases commercialize the research. And what we've learned over the last 10 years of doing that is that you really have to know 
how to solve the problems that arise working with industry. Like, first of all, many academics don't know what industry requires. Industry doesn't know what academic requires, and if you go into a collaboration with industry, neither side knows what the other side wants or needs, then you're, you're bound to fail. So you have to learn those lessons, and you have to know people that know about intellectual property, you have to have people that know how to engage with industry, how to bring business in, you have to have those people to work with the academics, because the academics don't know how to do those things. We are very lucky in the Cran Nanoscience Centre in Dublin that we have those things, but there are many universities throughout Europe and in Asia and America that don't have those things, and you have to develop that sort of ability and knowledge of how to work with industry. Now, this will be developed, it takes time, but that really, in my view, is the key to successful industry academic engagement. Okay, so the, the research team is not just in the university? No, the research team will be the guys in the lab doing the research, there will be the industry engineers and the people that bring them together and facilitate the, the, the union through things like, like intellectual property management and commercialization skills. And you need all of the bits for it to work properly. Okay, is European innovation policy looking in the right direction? I, I think so. I, I, th I think it is. I think the balance is very, very important. I think it's going to be critically important to get the balance between basic research, which provides the raw material for the ideas that lead to applied research, and then the, the infrastructure and the funding and the skills to use that basic research to apply it and ultimately to commercialize it. So it's, it's like a, a three-legged stool where you need all of the legs or it will collapse and you have to get the balance right. Okay, how do we compare with the Americans when it comes to research and, and the application of research? Well, I think we're doing very, very good research. I think if you look at papers in, in front-rack journals coming out of Europe, I think you were doing just as well as the Americans or the Asians. Where we're falling down, perhaps, is that we're not patenting enough and we're not commercializing enough. So I think this is, you know, this is a clear lesson of what we have to improve. And you know, patenting is one thing. You know, maybe there's a cultural issue that can be addressed there. But even when we get the patenting right, we have to learn, I think, a little bit more about the commercialization to bridge the gap between the basic research that in many cases happens in the university and the commercialization that in many cases happens in the companies. So we just have to bridge that gap. It's not an unknown black magic thing. You know, people know how to do this, so we just have to you know, learn the rules, implement them broadly, and I think it will be okay, but it is important that we do this. Okay, final question. Looking through history, what makes a great researcher? Well, curiosity. I mean, you have to wonder at the world, but another thing that's really, really important is when you see an unexpected result, you have to not just reject that and throw it in the bin, you have to say, well, why did that happen? Follow it up, and that's where many of the great discoveries have come from. You also have to be prepared. You know, you have to have the right sort of, uh, you have to know your stuff, you have to write sort of set of thought process, but really, I think it's about curiosity and the willingness to go and ask the questions, follow them up, and be tenacious.